Um, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to the January meeting uh, of the Chelmsford City Council Cabinet. I'm Councillor Stephen Robinson, the leader of the City Council and chair of the Cabinet. I'd like to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded and streamed live uh, on our Facebook page. Before we start, um, I'd just like to mention a few housekeeping arrangements. Hopefully you're taking part in a place where you won't be disturbed. And as with all meetings, when you're not actively participating, uh, will councillors, officers and the public attending please keep their audio and video turned off? Anyone wishing to speak should now use the raise hand function in Microsoft Teams. And I will call them when it's their turn to speak. The chat box function should not be used. Now, this is a new procedure for public meetings and requires councillors to raise their hand as we get to each item, not in advance. If the point you're making is addressed by someone else during the discussion, it would be helpful if you lower your hand and don't speak, especially this evening as we have a very long agenda. As always, questions and contributions must come through the chair and please remember to turn on your video and order audio when I call you to speak. Any councillor with an interest in any item should declare it and keep their audio and video off when it's being considered and they won't be included in any vote. When it comes to a decision on any of the recommendations before us, I will assume that if no one says that they oppose, everyone is in agreement. If we lose the live stream, I will adjourn the meeting and hopefully the problem can be fixed. But if not, we'll adjourn the meeting until a future date. So tonight is a long agenda. And this is how I'm going to deal with the items. Item four is public questions. I will take the two questions relating to Highlands Park from Stephen Leadham and Rittle Parish Council. The three questions relating to the Warren Farm Master Plan will be taken at the start of that item, which is 6.1. <clears throat> so now we're moving on to the actual agenda. To start the meeting, Mr Mayfield to read out the attendance list. Yes, sir. thank you, Chair. Um, the members of the Cabinet are present, and everybody is present actually. Uh, yourself, uh, Councillor Stephen Robinson, Chris Davidson, Marie Goldman, Michael McCrory and Rose Moore. Uh, the Deputy mem Members of the Cabinet uh, present are Anne Davidson, Natasha Dudley, Simon Goldman and Chloe Tron. Um, there are a number of uh, opposition spokespersons also present. They are Keith Bentley, Nicolette Chambers, Paul Clark, Wendy Dayden, Sue Dobson, John Galley, Neil Gulliver, Richard Porter, James Raven, Ian Roberts, Malcolm Sismi, Mike Steele and Roy Whitehead. Um, there are a number of officers present, but those uh, I mentioned here, there are others. Uh, Nick Evely, the Chief Executive, Mandy Fay, the Director of Financial Services, David Green, the Director of Sustainable Communities, Keith Nicholson, the Director of Public Places, and Louise Goodwin, um, uh, Director of, uh, for Connected Chelmsford, Lorraine Brown, the Le Legal and Democratic Um, Bill Reeves and Rob Hawes. Um, there are other officers present, um, and I'm Brian Mayfield from Democratic Services. We've had just one apology for absence, Chair, and that's from one of the opposition spokespersons, Councillor Richard Highland. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so moving on to declarations of interest, if anybody has any, would they please de declare that now? Okay, Councillor Goldman. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I've discussed the matter of uh, predetermination or potential predetermination with the monitoring officer, and um, I've decided to withdraw from item 6.1 on the agenda this evening. Thank you. OK. Um, nobody else? No? Thank you. Right. Um, moving on to um, item three, the minutes of the meeting on the 17th of November 2020. Uh, is that agreed, members? Agreed. Thank you. Um, right, moving on to, to public questions. 
Um, I've looked in the list. Is, Miss, is Stephen Leadham present? He appears not to be, Chair. Yeah. I haven't admitted so, him, so perhaps he's either late or unable to attend. Yeah. Um, would you like to read out the question? Oh, he's just yes. he's actually just trying to join, I think. Um, so I'm going to... Who is here, who is here from Rittle Parish Council? Uh, nobody's here from the Parish okay. Council, Chair. OK, all right. So, Mr Leesdom, are you with us now? I am here. If you can, Would you like to ask your question? Uh, certainly, thank you. Uh, OK, so the question as was... Could you just confirm um, whereabouts in Chelmsford you're from and then ask your question? OK. Sorry, I'm just... OK, so I'm actually from Hayes Close. OK. Uh, which is in Mulsham. Yeah. Uh, my question is, um, as reported in the Yellow Advertiser on the 19th of January 2021, there is a proposal to introduce parking charges at Highlands Park to help fill the budget shortfall brought about by current pandemic actions. And yet, at the same time, you are proposing discretionary spending of over £1 million, including enhancements of a theatre that can't even be used during said pandemic. Not to mention the additional £135,000 required to install the car park charging system in the first place. Uh, should the committee rather consider deferring all of these non-discretionary projects until such time as the pandemic is over and revenues are restored? And secondly, if such park and charges are introduced to cover the shortfall during the pandemic, <coughs> will they then be removed once the pandemic is declared over and normal business has resumed? And further and finally, uh, Councillor Chris Davison has stated we have no plans to charge for parking at any of the other local parks, and that includes Andrews Park. Highlands is a destination park with people travelling significant distances to visit, many of them from outside the city council area, and enjoying the fantastic facilities without paying for them. So if the focus is on those outside of the city council area, then why not just charge them and keep it free as opposed to discounted for those local too? and already paying for the fantastic facilities through their council tax. That's the end of my question. OK, thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr Mayfield, could you read out the similar question from Rittle? Uh, yes, Chair. It reads, Rittle Parish Council strongly objects to the introduction of car park charges at Highlands Park. During the first lockdown, Paradise Road was gridlocked and the Parish Council's car park full. If charges were implemented at Highlands, it would have a serious impact on Riffle, especially those living in Paradise, Paradise Road and for the users of these facilities at Riffle Sports and Social Club, where the demand on the car park is already at capacity over weekends. Essex Highways has recently carried out a traffic count on the road due to the large increase in pedestrian footfall, cyclists and cars. This is due to the direct access to Highlands Park and the facilities at Riddle Sports and Social Club. Uh, and that ends that statement, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Davison to reply to both. Uh, evening, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, Mr Leadham, for your question. Uh, you quoted an answer I gave on social media. The question was whether charging for parking at Highlands meant we would also introduce charges for parking at Andrews Park. I said we have no plans uh, to charge for parking at any of Chelmsford's local parks, including Andrews Park. And I explained that our local parks are different from Highlands, which is a destination park. People travel significant distances to visit Highlands. That was the answer to the question, but it's not the sole reason for introducing parking charges. There are several reasons for doing so. One is the budget pressures created by COVID-19. Highlands Park costs Chelmsford taxpayers at least £520,000 a year, even after taking into account the event and higher fees that we generate. The City Council simply can no longer afford this cost, given the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on our income. 
car parking income will be permanently down by maybe £1.6 million a year. And we're forecasting that budget pressure will continue throughout the period to 2026. And that leaves the choice between either cutting back on staffing at Highlands Park or on other vital services, or introducing a Highlands parking charge so that we can continue to invest in the staff to maintain Highlands and all Chelmsford's parks to a high standard. Um, so that's the budget reason, but also fairness is another reason. Those who drive to Highlands Park should contribute to the, the cost of running it. This includes those who drive from outside the Chelmsford City Council area. Um, and it would not be right for services to Chelmsford's taxpayers to be cut to make the budget balance so that those who are not Chelmsford taxpayers can continue enjoying Highlands free of charge. And then there's a third reason, managing the park is also a factor. The car parks are heavily used and we need to manage the number of visitors or overuse will lead to damage to the park. So those, those are the reasons we need to introduce these charges and why I can't offer any hope that they'll be temporary or could be limited to non-residents. Mr Leedham has also suggested that we should defer discretionary projects until revenues are restored once the pandemic is over. But as I've explained, we don't expect that revenues will be restored. Some of the income will be lost permanently. And stopping all but essential expenditure, as suggested, would put Chelmsford in the same category as other councils that have mismanaged their finances, leading to bankruptcy. Chelmsford City Council has been and always will be a council that practices sound financial management. We need to use this strength to help the local economy recover, making carefully chosen important investments while also protecting our essential services that will deliver a greener, fairer, better connected Chelmsford. Mr Leadham mentions in particular the investment in the theatres, and I'm very proud to pre present a budget to Cabinet tonight that includes this proposal. It's capital investment, not day-to-day -day spending, which is where the budget pressure is. It will develop, uh, deliver payback through the revenues it enables us to achieve in future, but it's much more than this. It will enable us to make the Civic Theatre a more flexible space so that we can broaden and diversity, di diversify the way we use it for the benefit of the community. This will attract people into Chelmsford, helping to grow our city's economy. And doing this while the theatre cannot be used due to COVID-19 is precisely the right time to be investing. Better to do the work at a time when closing the theatre doesn't affect revenues and when the local economy needs a boost from the temporary jobs that will be created. Uh, so that's the, uh, the answer to, to that question. Uh, and I'll move on now to the question from Rittle Parish Council. Um, and I have a, a shorter answer to that one. We're very aware that managing the parking in the vicinity of the park will need careful consideration. We will be consulting on the details, and this will be one of the most important details. And we look forward to working with Rittle Parish Council as part of the consultation process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, could I remind um, councillors to turn off their video if they're not speaking? Um, Councillor McCrory. Um, right. Um, I, uh, so that's uh, the public questions completed. Um, so moving on to item five, um, members' questions. Had, are there any questions from opposition spokespeople on, on subjects that aren't on the agenda tonight. No? Okay. Um, right, so moving on then, um, this is moving on to section six, which is sustainable development items. And the first one is 6.1. Uh, strategic Growth Site uh, West Chelmsford ma Master Plan. Uh, first to note, Councillor Goldman has already said she won't take part. And secondly, uh, I believe Councillor Poulter has a question. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my question, in view of the strong recommendation of officers set out in the subparagraph to paragraph four. Please can you let us know what formal training each cabinet member has received to consider taking a decision 
contrary to officers' recommendation in paragraph 5.3. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, well, I can uh, reassure you that Cabinet members have met with officers in both legal services and planning policy on two separate occasions it, to establish the parameters for this item. And our legal advice is that Cabinet is acting as a policy making body, not a planning committee. And the detailed advice from officers has been included in the public report, uh, which weighs, uh, sets out all of the possible issues. And everyone, including cabinet members, have already had the opportunity to consider. But cabinet members will, of course, listen to all speakers on this item this evening and weigh up those comments when forming their decision tonight. Um, so if I can now take the uh, other questions from the public. Um, and I believe I saw Mr. Hammond. John Hammond, are you there? Good evening, Chairman. Thank you. Do you, want, do you yes, sorry. You, yes, Mr. Yes, John Hammond, and then uh, Joanne Hawkins, then Naomi, and then Rittle Parish Council. Thank you. Um, before agreeing the West Chelmsford Master Plan, councillors should check whether the proposed off-site cycle and pedestrian routes are deliverable and fit for purpose. Otherwise, there will not be sufficient sustainable transport mitigation. There should also be a commitment that off-site cycle route improvements will be implemented before the first occupation of houses. Just to give example, I attach a photo of the narrow footway which is proposed as a route from Warren Farm to Highland School in the draft master plan. Some sections are only 1.5 metres wide, which is unacceptable for a shared path. There is little space to widen it on either side of the road because especially because this section of Roxwell Road has been squeezed for extra traffic lanes. In the absence of a suitable path, most parents would choose to drive children to Highland School, adding to traffic negative impacts on Roxwell Road, Lordship Road and outside the school. Similar constraints of boundary features and land ownership are likely to prevent continuity of the proposed cycleway in Chignall Road and widening of the footway on the east side of Lordship Road. This cycle plan shows a cycle route linking Chicken Road across Roxwell Road to Beaches Drive. A specific cycle crossing of Roxwell Road is needed, but the master plan and addendum proposed motor traffic scheme for Roxwell Road, Chicken Road have no provision for this, so need amending. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, full question. I'm going to take all the all the questions um, and then get Councillor McCrory to respond. Um, Joanne Hawkins. Thank you very much. Um, so if I may, I'd like to start by briefly responding to some comments from previous consultation meetings um, and some local media. Uh, the bus gate will sit in the only green space and play area for the entire Chigwell estate and will not only directly impact the Chignall inhabitants, but also the new residents of Warren Farm. As of November last year, combined petitions against the bus gate stood at close to 900 signatures. The entire Chignall community is united against the bus gate, not just a few local residents, as it has been falsely suggested. <clears throat> the safety issues around the bus gate must be acknowledged. Officers commissioned a road safety audit carried out by specialist safety consultants in February 2019. Amongst others, the following results were listed within section three of the report. Risk to children's safety from the bus route proximity to the playground. Compromised pedestrian viability with risk of collision from oncoming traffic. Compromised visibility and swept paths increasing the risk of collisions and risk of bus and pedestrian collisions. Please consider these issues and then include a large play, <coughs> excuse me, a large play park directly adjacent with numerous families, dog walkers and children, shops and two schools either side of the link and potentially hundreds of cyclists every day. The formal response to these results noted on the audit document is, and I quote, the problem is not accepted by the design team. Um, one of the responses again within the audit was, <clears throat> there, has, there hasn't been an accident here in 20 years. If we took that approach, the flyover would still be standing. 
Um, and that was also clearly not safe for the future. Professional specialist consultants are telling us that there are problems with the safety of the proposed bus gate. However, as you can see, they're not being listened to. This suggests a willful disregard for the safety and well-being of the Chignall community. There will be approximately 2,500 more people living next, to, uh, living next to and using this link, including high numbers of cyclists and children, additional shops, parks and schools. That's what we should be building for. What message does it send to the Chignall residents and those of the new development when the safety advice from specialist consultants is just dismissed in such a way? What if there's a severe accident at this junction, potentially with a child? What could councillors say to local communities, considering all the warnings and evidence that was given to them, highlighting the safety concerns? The lives and well-being of the Chignall community matter. The safety of the community, children, pedestrians and cyclists using the link matter. They're not expendable. They can't be disregarded just so something that is unsafe and environmentally destructive can be forced onto them. The officer's amendment, sorry, the officer's addendum report states that buses accessing via the A1060 will have no adverse effect on the operation of Roxwell Road. So why choose a strategy that is so destructive on one community and a risk to its safety when there is an option that has minimal disruption on either communities? The residents of Chickenlow Estate agree that the addendum has to be the way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Naomi Paul, are you there? Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the, uh, this opportunity to, to read a statement on behalf of the Chignall Estate Residents Association. Um, there have been concerted efforts from some to deliberately downplay the impact of the bus gate, even in the face of extensive evidence clearly showing the destructive implications that it entails. The bus gate imposes the following on the Chignall community. First, an approximately two metre high flyover carving through the open green space and overlooking gardens. The proposed design shows buses will travel uphill through the gate, meaning higher revving engines, causing increased noise and pollution to adjacent properties, gardens and playground. The lower the bridge, the steeper the slope into Avon Road, the greater the negative impacts. Secondly, buses will run from 5.30 in the morning to 11.30 at night most days. The proposed road is within one foot of neighbouring properties and there is a clear risk to residents from noise and vehicle pollution. Thirdly, no consideration has been made to the risks from heavy vehicle vibrations over time on neighbouring buildings. Fourth, the removal of three large high quality trees from Avon Road, damaging the local environment further and removing screening from traffic. Fifth, the loss of allotments. Sixth, spatial standards are far below recommended standards for such a location. The quote, just because you can, doesn't mean you should, comes to mind. And finally, the bus gate requires 10 traffic signals. I repeat that, 10 signals in the vicinity of the junction. There are junctions on Parkway with fewer signals, yet no lux level analysis has been carried out on the bus gate. Moving on, planning policy DC4, protecting existing amenity, states that all development proposals should safeguard the amenities of occupiers of ne nearby properties by ensuring that the development would not result in excessive noise excessive activity or vehicle movement, or present overlooking or visual intrusion. The bus gate compromises each one of these. None of these impacts were shown in the local plan, and none of these would be the result of a cycle link. Sarah understand that a cycle link requires some loss of habitat. However, there is no comparison between a bus flyover and a pedestrian cycleway. Yes, buses currently use Avon Road, but houses are 10 metres from the road, with trees and hedging in front. Buses passing within one foot uphill from early morning till near midnight is clearly not the same. Let's not pretend it is. The officer's report for the October 2020 policy board meeting stated, and I quote, the master plan document does not include analysis on environmental impact. This effectively emphasises Sarah's position that noise levels, emission levels, heavy vehicle vibration, light pollution, risk to residents' health and well-being, risk to children's safety, loss of trees, loss of allotments, compromised parking and pedestrian and cyclist safety have not been properly considered. Finally, 
The premise that the buses using Roxwell Road will impact Rittle more than a bus gate would impact the Chignall estate has no merit. Item 40 of the addendum states, these bus services would not have any adverse impact on the operation of Roxwell Road. Detailed evidence presented by CIRA together with a specialist consultant confirms the bus gate will have a hugely destructive impact on the Chignall estate, its environment and its residents, not to mention the residents of Warren Farm. CIRA therefore again reiterate our position that there is an obvious common sense decision to be made and that is to adopt the master plan addendum. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. And, and, and finally, I, I don't think anybody from the Par Rittal Parish Council is present. So, Mr Mayfield, can you read out their statement? Uh, yes, certainly, Chair. Uh, Rittal Parish Council's planning committee and the Neighbourhood Plan Steering Group would like to highlight the following points on the revised master plan. Some are completely new, whilst others have been raised earlier, but not adequately dealt with. We are disappointed that we've had only a short time to consider re the revisions to the master plan. Therefore, the comments are brief, but will hopefully identify our concerns. One, this is the first time we have seen agricultural field on the north side of Foxborough's Lane marked as playing fields. The parish councils will understand this is an error and will be removed from the plan. Two, there is still some doubt about the local sports area shown within the one Warren Farm development and the layout of the playing fields with just football pitches shown and possibly an artificial cricket pitch and no facilities. It is difficult to understand how this will effectively be used for any organised sport. There is no maintenance plan. This facility is likely to attract traffic out of area. We strongly believe that this facility should be for the residents of the new estate and the children of our parish. Three, there is no evidence of significant proposed tree planting to enhance the biodiversity of the site and to help counteract flooding from excess surface water that will be caused by the buildings. Four, the pavements are shown still as narrow on Rockfell Road. Discussions were had about a wider path and a segregated cycle route which would be supported by the Parish Council. Five, the proposed bus stops close to the doctors cannot be accommodated in this location. This is an accident black spot already. There needs to be greater recognition of the impacts of climate change. In the present master plan, no effective mitigation measures, proposals or renewable energy use are set out to achieve to help achieve the national and local net zero carbon targets either at this stage or in subsequent applications. Seven, details of how the environment at the cottages close to the widened Roxwell Road, Lordship Road roundabout will be handled in terms of noise, fumes, dust and air quality needs to be identified at some point. Eight, it is noted that village signs are shown to be erected along the Roxwell Road identifying the Warren Farm development as Chelmsford when it is clearly in the parish of Riddle. On page 28, a village gateway feature has been mapped at a random location along Lordship Road and does not mark the start of the parish of Riddle. Nine, the cycle route using Lawford Lane to connect to Highland School is still unviable even with the measures suggested. These would not cover periods of flood when impassable, leaving reliance on cars when there is insufficient parking at the school for parents. Car travel for school journeys should be discouraged with a more viable route to the senior school. 10. There is still no biodiversity plan for improvement so as to achieve net gain or to connect wilder places under a nature recovery scheme. 11. There seems little about flood risk in the document. This has been excessive and consistently so in Cow Watering Lane, Lordship Road, so measures must be in place to improve this and mitigate against it, as the village has been cut off in this direction several times recently. It is considered that some of the above points could have been dealt with earlier in consultation with the Parish Council, the developer and the City Council, rather than be presented with a document at this late stage. Planning proposals and applications should have due regard to the Riddle Neighbourhood Plan and to the AECON Design Code, both of which the developer and the council are aware of. 
Whittle Parish Council looks forward to such consultations. That's the end of the statement, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, Councillor McCrory to respond and then introduce the report. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, Councillor Mike McCrory, Cabinet Member for Sustainable Development. So, moving to Mr Hammond's questions. Uh, in fact, uh, what we've done, Mr Hammond, is to treat each paragraph separately and then have the answer for you. So, uh, with regard to the first paragraph, um, yes, ideally the routes should be operational before first occupation. Um, and that is other than the Melbourne Avenue option, which would be a, a contribution which would be payable prior to first op occupation. However, there is detail for the Section 106 legal agreement associated with the planning application. Um, for the second paragraph, uh, with regard to cycle routes uh, in Lawford Lane, yes, what's proposed via Lawford Lane. The other route via Beaches Drive would be for pedestrians. It is labelled as Highland School route in figure 18, which is correct. And the green sheet identifies an error in this figure 18, which is to be amended post this cabinet meeting. And then moving on to the next um, sentence regarding cycle and Chignall Road. There are constraints on Lordship Road and it's uh, envisaged that widening will take place within the existing highway. Uh, and it is proposed that this will remain as a footway. Uh, so regarding the cycle plan, um, highways are in agreement that a Toucan crossing is required if the cycle route is provided on Chignall Road. But this is a detail and will be agreed with the improvement scheme for Roxwell Road, uh, Chignall Road uh, as agreed. So that's um, Mr Hawkins, uh, uh, sorry, Mr Hammond. Um, so Joanne Hawkins, um, quite a long statement there before we get to a, a question as such. So if I go down to the very end, uh, Ms Hawkins, um, just following on from when you say the addendum is clearly the way forward. So yes, so your concerns are noted. But however, the safety concerns are not shared by Essex County Council Highways. The master plan has been amended following the recommendation from the policy board based on impact upon the amenity of the area, including residential properties. And it's for members to endorse or not this option through recommendation or one. And you'll hear the debate which follows shortly. Um, and a technical point, the content of the addendum presented to the policy board in October is now encapsulated within the revised master plan document. And Cabinet are voting on the revised master plan, not specifically the addendum. And then moving on to Naomi Paul, So if I can just respond to the point you make about planning policy DC4. Uh, technically, policy DC4 has been replaced in the new local plan by policy DM29. And then at the end of your um, statement and questions, so your concerns are noted um, and as you will hear as the debate proceeds, and what's very clear in the report is that Cabinet have two options. Number one, accepts no bus link. Number two, will require its reinstatement into the master plan. And that's a decision Cabinet must make this evening. And again, to clarify, this evening Cabinet are considering a revised master plan 
not specifically the addendum presented to the policy board. So moving on to Riddle Parish Council, uh, question one, yes, uh, we uh, have picked up that error as well and the green sheet identifies it as such. Uh, question two, uh, your comments are noted. The master plan does indicate a sports pavilion changing facilities. A, ma a maintenance plan would be a detail for the planning application and its section 106 legal agreement when they come forward. Uh, question three, the illustrative master plan in figure 16 includes such figures as boundary reinforcement, woodland blocks, green space, orchard, landscape buffer, tree planting and attenuation basins. Tree planting would appear to be significant and a surface water acknowledged in the proposed layout. Question four, uh, again, just to underline the point, the master plan is illustrative. The details will be agreed at the planning application stage to ensure that good quality pedestrian and cycle routes are secured. Uh, question five, the master plan indicates a commitment by the developer to provide bus stops and is illustrative at this time. This detail will be agreed as part of the planning application when it comes in. Uh, question six, the developer has committed to comply with the relevant national guidance and Chums had adopted policy regarding sustainable building, including renewable and low carbon energy development requirements. Um, this is set out, adopted local plan and the Making Places SPD supplementary planning document, which we will be discuss shortly this evening. Question seven, uh, again, um, this is a matter which comes later with the planning application. Question eight, uh, yes, we note your comments and again point out the master plan is illustrative. The exact details of the uh, location and wording of the signage will be agreed at the planning application stage. Uh, question nine, uh, topical point you make, uh, in times of flood, yes, cyclists may have to rely on the circuitous route through the village. Uh, when there is also village in the, in, uh, flooding in the village, there may be occasions when pupils will have to travel by alternative means to Highland School, um, but that applies to um, many places when, uh, when we have heavy rainfall. But however, these flooding issues are intermittent and usually for short periods only. Uh, question 10, uh, again, this will be a detail for the planning application. And question 11, uh, yes, flood risk is acknowledged in the document. It's not a major theme as most of the site is outside of the flood zone. And the final point, uh, yes, uh, officers and myself have noted your requests uh, and we will be doing that in future as the uh, process proceeds. So I hope that answers all the questions and I thank uh, everyone who took the trouble to put their questions to us. Yeah, thank you very much. So yeah, uh, moving on to introduce the report. <laughs> yes. You just muted yourself, Mike McCorry. How sensitive these things are. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this master plan for the Strategic Growth Site 2, um, West Chelmsford, perhaps now better known as Warren Farm, comes before Cabinet following consideration by the July and October policy boards when recommendations were made for Cabinet to consider. 
And two options are available to us and the information to enable Cabinet to inform their decisions is set out in the report reference policy, policy guidance in paragraphs 4.1 to 4.13 and in the conclusion 5.1 to 5.3. And if I could draw members' attention also to the Cress Nicholson actual master plan itself, plus we have the two policy board reports, their minutes and the addendum uh, which provides further detail and also the Essex Quality Review Panels report, all of which are appended. So firstly, if I may, um, make a brief comment on the master plan itself, which runs to some 26 pages. And here I must thank the developer and their planning officers for both the initial work um, that went into the original master plan and that which has been undertaken since October. Master plan is a very uh, comprehensive document which details the uh, various um, public and stakeholder engagements and the consultations that were held and the processes which follow to evaluate and bring together the views of interested parties and requirements of the local plan. But the recommendations from the policy board have been incorporated, as have some of the Essex Quality Review Panels, where officers agree and uh, are relevant at this stage in the process. Most notably, the relocation of the school and the local neighbourhood centre westwards. Also, the green softening of the boundary of the site with the open landscape to the west. So we now have uh, a landscape-led master plan that will deliver high quality, sustainable neighbourhood, comprising around 800 dwellings, included much needed affordable housing in accordance with the local plan, a new primary school, local centre, sports pitches, significant green open space, including an ecology park and orchard, reasonable access to bus routes and additional safe routes for walking and cycling. The latter takes on board the recommendations of the October Policy Board. And there is also the provision for the five travelling show persons pitches to the southwest corner of the site. So uh, referring to the Cabinet report, there is of course the major change from the original master plan proposals presented to the July Policy Board. Uh, and this is regarding the removal of the bus link as originally proposed in the adopted local plan. And as referred to in my opening remarks, the officer's opinion and the factors for Cabinet to consider are detailed at some length in the report. It is made clear that it is for the Cabinet, as the decision maker, to weigh those various factors when deciding which option to follow. As with planning committee and planning decisions I have to make over planning applications, decisions on planning matters are finely balanced. And this is evident in the two options contained within the officer's report. However, I'm sure cabinet members uh, are fully aware of these issues read all the reports and will be in no doubt that in deciding which option to support, they must be sure in their own mind that it is material planning considerations that determine their decision. Uh, with that, Chair, um, I'll open it for discussion. Thank you.
Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, I have first of all our councillor Mike Steele uh, for the Conservative Group. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I want to pick up a few points that Councillor McCrory's made there. Um, I'm kind of concerned about this process. Um, in fact, I think uh, Councillor McCrory kind of touched upon the planning requir rec law requires that applications for planning permission be determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Um, certainly in reading the report, I got the impression and the recommendation of our own officers is that whilst impact upon residential amenity can be a material planning consideration, it, it, it is in doubt as to whether this outweighs a specific element of the local plan, namely the inclusion of the bus link, uh, as that was a key element of the local plan um, as it maximises bus penetration into the site. Um, the local plan has only been recently adopted. It, it's gone through a rigorous statutory preparation and public consultation process and has been examined and found sound by an inspector. And the inspector concluded, amongst other things, that the provision of a bus link for the West, West Chelmsford development was required. So whether you think um, um, uh, traffic levels and so on uh, are impacted by lack of uh, bus link or, or not. Um, my concern is around this process that the, um, whether there is actually sufficient material consideration to deviate from the local plan by removing the bus link um, and to allow such a change without appropriate justification. I am concerned it sets a dangerous precedence uh, in that future. Uh, master plans, um, you know, in discarding the local plan and the master plan due process and the first master plan, that there is a danger that we end up here uh, many times and other master plans and planning, planning applications, can you know, we give them open license to deviate from what's previously agreed. And we're in fact discarding all the comments and, and, and issues collected through the local plan process and through the previous master plan process. Um, so I, I sit here with some concerns in uh, what we are doing. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I would say partly I dealt with that when answering Councillor Poulter's question, I think, earlier. Um, and uh, as I said, we've taken advice that uh, in this case, Cabinet is acting as a policy making body, not a planning committee. And therefore, uh, there is um, scope, slightly wider scope um, for the debate. And um, so there are, uh, you're, you raise a, a, a concern, but I think, uh, as Councillor McCrory said, it's for cabinet members to uh, read the report and listen to the debate and, and weigh up those uh, those decisions. And officers have made it quite clear to us that it is open to, for for cabinet to take the, to decide between uh, option one or option two, and that they are both valid options, and that it's for members to listen to what other contributions have, have to say. So I'm gonna move on now to uh, Councillor Bentley, and you might want to put, yeah, thank you. Uh, so Councillor Bentley. Hello there. Um, yeah, just a comment on that. The, um, just looking at the master plan on page 26, I think it is. Um, there is one route that's shown penetrating the site. I, it's um, one of the optional or proposed routes, uh, route one via Chignall Road. Um, I don't know whether that meets the local plan um, requirements or not, but um, there is a, a bus route um, proposed to go on site. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there are in the uh, the, the addendum which has been added has, has made a number of uh, suggested um, additions on sort of on bus services. Um, I haven't seen any other hands, and I I don't see any I, I don't see any other councillors wishing to speak. Any other non cabinet members? Now then, I'm just caught. No, I'm just I was just pausing to see if anybody else wanted to come in. Um, so um, I'll move on to the cabinet members then. Um, Councillor Moore. Thank you, Chair. I welcome the opportunity to speak this evening. 
Um, I also welcome the great detail in the officer's report that's accompanied the papers tonight and the considerable time they have spent in consultation with us as cabinet members um, over the past days. I understand as a public forum, it's very important that um, I, I outline my initial concerns as a member of policy board. Um, and it was the severance of habitat and ecological aspects that concerned me most in terms of any development which will leave a footprint on the environment. Um, and I understand and I'm reassured by officers that in this case, um, ecological impact can be mitigated. Um, however, the, the scale of the build in the landscape and the contour of the land being eliminated through this structure still concerns me. Um, the inspector originally outlined um, the location of the bus link, but there were no details of the structure um, at the point of adoption of the local plan. Um, in fact, in paragraph 4.9 in the report, the inspector, um, it, it, so the officers state, um, at that stage, the lack of design was not considered to outweigh the principle of a bus link in that location. At that stage, the lack of design was not considered to outweigh the principle. It is the reality of the design that concerns me here. It is the loss of amenity to the local residents who are currently living here and also to those who will, we hope, enjoy the children's play area and the allotments um, that are established there. So I continue to have deep concerns um, around the scale of this structure. And that remains a material consideration. And it's the loss of immunity that I, I cannot reconcile, although I accept that the ecological impact can be mitigated and I do accept that this carries little weight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Davison. Uh, yes. So uh, apologies for, um, for not introducing myself earlier. Um, I'm Chris Davidson. I'm a cabinet member for Affair at Chelmsford, which covers uh, finance and housing. Um, so from a housing perspective, uh, it, it, this will be helpful. Um, but um, I have. I have been I have taken this very seriously. Um, the key decision is not whether we approve a master plan tonight. It's whether or not we include the original bus link in it. That's the key decision. And as Councillor McCrory said, officers have provided a lot of advice in the paper about how we should approach this task. Um, and I'm just going to go through my notes. Uh, and at the end of this, I will supply my notes to uh, Mr Mayfield uh, for the record. Um, but officers caution that our decision should be reasoned. And we should articulate the basis uh, for omitting the bus link if that's what we do. Um, that's why I've gone through this in some considerable detail. And I've tried to identify uh, all the factors that have, uh, that have been mentioned um, and to work out what weights we ought to give them. We need to identify and then consider all of those and then reach a decision. So the first one uh, is the local plan itself. The removal of a bus link creates a conflict uh, with the adopted local plan. And I think this is where Councillor Steele was coming from. Um, uh, Naomi Poole also mentioned uh, planning uh, obligation DC4, uh, but uh, Councillor McCrory responded um, to that. Um, whichever way you look at it though, um, the fact that the local plan was adopted recently must carry significant weight. Um, the second uh, item, uh, and Councillor Moore uh, was talking about this recently, uh, is residential amenity. Uh, and I'm going to go through this in slightly more detail. Officers advise that the impact on residential amenity is a material consideration and may warrant a reappraisal of the bus link. 
but only if no mitigating circumstances would render the bus link acceptable. So it seems to me that we need to consider how the rural design and extent of anticipated use as now understood would affect residential amenity, and that's uh, what I'd call A. B is whether and how mitigation could reduce that impact. C then is how this mitigated impact is different from what was foreseeable when the local plan was found sound. And then we need to uh, decide how much weight to give, if any. So uh, on the first question, what's been revealed in the detailed designs, uh, to my mind, is not simply a road through the woods to allow buses to move from Warren Farm Estate to Chignall Road Estate. The introduction of buses per se would have inconvenienced um, the residents, some of the residents. Um, but most of the time, residents would have been able to enjoy their gardens, the playground, the woods, the allotments in peace, uninterrupted by the sound of a bus 97% of the time, on my calculation. It's the 3D impact of the design that can be visualised from the drawing that was provided on page 27 of the addendum. Now, I don't see this in the revised master plan, but I don't think there's been any change in the proposal. Um, so that is clearly um, the design feature that we're now looking at. The scale of the required engineering is clear. The bus link bridge would stretch between three and three and a half metres above the natural level of the land at the highest point, with the elevated roadway extending a considerable distance in either direction east and west of the watercourse, as it equalises the natural contours of the land. By the playground and the allotments, even the elevated roadway would be around one and a half metres above the natural ground level. And on the other side of the water, it reaches around two metres in height. Uh, it would be constantly in your face. Um, and I think this was something that Sarah, Naomi uh, Poole were uh, referring to. Uh, an odd bus is one thing, but this structure is on a different level. So I have no doubt that this design of the bus link would have a seriously detrimental effect on residential amenity, and that's the answer to point A. Um, now, it will be possible to take the harshness off the design, but it's very difficult to me to see how such a large structure, this high above the natural landscape, in this location, can possibly be mitigated satisfactorily. Um, I can see uh, mitigation reducing the, the structure to the alternative cycle and footway would still leave a significant structure. But two of the key mitigants um, that, uh, that you can see from this design uh, are the reduction in the overall scale and the removal of the need to make the roadway as flat as possible. And those can't be achieved with a bus link. And to my mind, that's the answer to my question B. Um, so I then move on. Um, the proposed height of the structure, especially the elevated section by the playground and allotments, uh, seems to me to have been a surprise to all commentators. Uh, and I'm convinced that that would have been a surprise to the inspector too. That the height of the elevated uh, section mitigated um, what had previously been expected to be a steep slope up the road. Um, the steep up, slope up the road um, was going to be a concern because of uh, the revving of buses um, uh, as they went in an easterly direction. Uh, and, and Naomi Poole uh, pointed this out on behalf of Sierra. But actually, I'm not sure there would be that much revving because the road, uh, the elevated section for the bus link uh, isn't that steep. But it's not that steep at the cost of a significantly more elevated section and at the most harmful point by the playground and allotments. And to my mind, that's the answer to, um, to point C as well. So as I go through it, um, I think that this would have significant um, detrimental impact on residential amenity. Um, and I don't think um, that that is simply the same as was originally envisaged. Uh, nor do I think that it's possible to mitigate it uh, or not, not sufficiently. Um, and therefore, uh, um, I think that is an important factor. And frankly, I would give that significant weight as well in the balancing exercise. 
The next factor to look at is ecological impact. Um, and Naomi Poole referred to the loss of three trees and the allotments. Uh, Councillor Moore uh, referred to her uh, concerns. But actually, uh, officers have advised that the ecological impact is not sufficient to make a material difference. Um, and um, accepting this analysis, I would give this uh, factor limited weight. We've also, um, it, it, certainly at the policy board, there was a lot of talk about the, uh, the impact on the Roxwell Road traffic. Um, the direct effect of eight extra buses an hour seems to me to be so marginal that it carries very little weight. Uh, and that's the point that Naomi Poole made on behalf of CIRA. Um, but there is potentially a wider impact if people drive instead of taking the bus. The maximum impact would be the number of people the local plan assumed would travel by bus to and from Warren Farm using the bus link, which was, um, I think we've been working on eight buses an hour. Um, but not all of those will choose to travel by car on Roxwell Road instead. Some will choose to walk, to cycle, to e-scooter, to car share, um, to take one of the other buses, either on Roxwell Road or Trent Road. Um, to travel by car, taking a different route, or just not to travel at all. So it seems to me that the overall impact on Roxwell Road caused by the removal of the bus link is likely to be small, uh, and that's a factor that should carry limited weight in this balancing exercise. We've then got the mitigation uh, measures that have been put in uh, to the master plan. Um, and I can see two ways to judge uh, these. As a standalone package, uh, they seem to me uh, to carry significant weight, that they, they, they are good measures. But to my mind, that would give disproportionate focus to one component of what essentially is a two-sided exchange. The mitigation measures have been offered as a replacement for the bus link. And uh, viewed in that way, the mitigation measures seem to me to be broadly neutral. The master plan being neither significantly better nor significantly worse for um, with the, with the met mitigation measures instead of the bus link. Um, so um, I then move on. The impact of COVID-19 seems to me to be uh, a significant material consideration. Since the local plan was adopted, there's been significant social upheaval. Far more people are working at home. This seems likely to continue to at least some extent. The number of people who commute into London five days a week is unlikely to ever return to pre-2020 levels. So if only 50% of the working population works at home and does so just one day a week, the total number of commuting journeys will reduce by 10%. So it seems to me that the assumptions made pre-COVID of the need for a bus link to encourage sustainable non-car trans transport are now obviously wrong. All other things being equal, fewer commuters wanting to get to the station each morning will mean that Warren Farm will have less impact than previously forecast on traffic. And this social change seems to me to be um, a significant factor in its own right that should carry medium weighting. We then uh, had a number of residents' objections. Um, Joanne Hawkins talked about the 900 residents who'd signed um, a petition, and she also uh, expressed grave concern about safety. Um, Sarah and Naomi Poole uh, also uh, talked about this. Um, Mike, uh, Councillor McCrory responded, um, but the, the simple fact is um, that this is covered in the advice from officers of paragraph 4.8. Any objections uh, beyond those uh, mentioned separately therefore carry very limited, if any, weight uh, in the balancing exercise. We've got some comments from the Essex Quality Review Panel, which are welcome. Um, and the panel, um, the report says, has no formal status and offers informal views only, providing an informal second opinion from a panel of experts. What I note, though, is that this isn't, um, this wasn't a, a recommendation. It was merely a comment about disappointment concerning a very specific detail of the master plan. And that seems to me to carry modest weight at best in this balancing exercise. Then um, it, it's worth 
going back to uh, the underlying objectives uh, of the local plan in putting the bus link in in the first place. And as I understand it, these are to prioritise sustainable forms of transport over the private car and thereby encourage people to make sustainable travel choices in order to secure a modal shift from the private car. The bus link was one of the measures intended to lead to this modal shift. It seems relevant to consider whether we can achieve our broader sustainability objectives without the bus link. Um, and the, the master plan contains a significant array of measures um, to encourage sustainability. I noticed that Riddle Parish Council uh, and uh, John Hammond in, uh, in their questions uh, were casting doubt on the deliverability, the viability uh, of some of these measures. Um, but Councillor uh, McCrory uh, referred to those measures, uh, but also uh, responded that the concerns um, would be dealt with at the detail stage. Um, uh, but it's clear that, um, that we need to have those. So other things being equal, um, I've already concluded that the removal of the bus link and its replacement uh, with alternative measures is broadly neutral in my view. But when it comes to uh, this overall objective of securing a modal shift, other things are not equal. There are various things that have changed. But the main one that's changed is social attitudes followed, following COVID-19. In the short term, people have been more reluctant to use any form of public transport, including buses. But we need to focus on sustainability over a significantly longer period. Longer term changes in societal attitudes to workplaces are likely to reduce the amount of travelling. And that's the context we should be thinking about. To my mind, we need more time to think about uh, and to see how these effects evolve. But the one thing that's clear to me is that Warren Farm is likely to be more sustainable in practice than it was expected to be before COVID-19 struck. And on this basis, I would give limited weight to retaining a bus link to achieve a modal shift from the use of private cars, given that we are in the midst of the biggest modal shift any of us will see in our lifetimes. So, in conclusion, we need to weigh all these relevant factors and decide for ourselves whether they point to retaining or removing the bus link. Um, Councillor Steele said we set a, a dangerous precedent. I, I don't think we're setting a precedent here. I think we're doing what we need to do, because as I understand it from the advice uh, from officers, um, we must consider whether there are material considerations. If we fail to consider whether there are material considerations that justify a different conclusion, then we are failing to do what we need to do. Uh, and that would itself be a potential cause to judicial reviewers. So I don't think we can simply say, this is the local plan, we are sticking to it, come what may, um, because um, otherwise we set a precedent. We, we will depart from uh, the local plan if it's justified, but not otherwise. Uh, Councillor Steele also said that uh, whether or not it, we should depart from uh, the local plan um, is in doubt, I think were his words. Uh, I agree with that. I, I don't think this is an easy decision at all. Um, the factors point in different directions, um, and I think it would be possible to justify either decision. Uh, but we have to make a decision. And having found two factors that I gave significant weight to, which pull in opposite directions, and all but one of the other factors carrying limited or modest weight and also pulling in different directions. For me, the balance is tilted by the final factor that I concluded should be given medium weighting. Um, so that, um, that was... Um, how I was minded um, to see this coming into this evening. I've listened carefully to all of uh, the, uh, the, the points that have been made, but nothing that has been made uh, has caused me uh, to change the, the view I have of any of the specific factors or of the overall uh, way in which I balance them. And therefore my view is that we should approve option one um, that's to say, uh, th that's to say, we should agree with option one, approve the draft master plan, including the deletion of the bus link, 
Uh, and I would also be happy to approve op option three, which is the means by which either of the main options can be given effect. So apologies for taking up so much time, but I thought it was important to set this out um, as carefully as possible. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for that um, full analysis. Um, I'd just like to, to add uh, my own thanks to the officers for all the work that's been done on this and, and the changes. Um, I, I do think, uh, as Councillor McCrory said, I do think we should look at the, the, the big picture, the master plan and it's in its totality um, is a, uh, an important and welcome document that has a number of positive benefits. Um, even though originally I was opposed to this site allocation, it's coming, so we need to um, ensure that we get the best possible outcome. And this master plan uh, makes a lot of positive steps in the in the right direction to make it a genuinely sustainable community deliver the much needed housing and community facilities that we need and uh, especially affordable housing um but um the uh, uh, the additions or the changes which we're now being now being put before us um it's it's material i think that uh, the designs were not available before the local plan, the designs of the bus link. And uh, that's been mentioned, uh, how we have it become apparent what was being proposed, which was not apparent at the time the local plan was approved. Um, and uh, Joanne Hawkins and Naomi Paul have set out how uh, this would impact on the on residential amenity even with uh, mitigation that, would, that uh, might be proposed. Um, for, for example, the, uh, we're not just talking about the amenity of the immediate neighbours, but for all of the residents of the estate, when they use the play area and, and the football pitch, the large uh, bus bridge would be there 100% of the time, even if there were no buses travelling. Um, and the addition of a number of traffic light columns um, would affect and change the nature of uh, what is a, a, a relatively quiet residential area to being something more of a, of a town centre. So for me, that, that is uh, significant and that uh, it is a balanced, uh, balanced judgment, but the harm to residential amenity in the broadest sense, not just the immediate neighbours, um, is not... Um, overcome by the uh, mitigation that is that was suggested and uh, so I welcome the ad addendum and that's now been incorporated um, which does have a number of positive additions to this plan um, and uh, more investment in cycling facilities uh, increases freedom of choice for the individual and expands the use of a zero carbon form of transport so that's to be welcome um, and a, a number of points have been made in other public questions which need to be addressed. Uh, but um, I've, I've listened to what everyone has, has said, and it is, it is a finely balanced issue. But I come to the conclusion that uh, the, the harm to the, the amenity of the residents of the Chignall Estate um, is too substantial um, to be allowed to happen. And so therefore, I would propose that we go with op option one. So, um, and finally, uh, Councillor McCrory, anything to sum up? Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, no, I think we've had a, a very good um, airing of the subject. I think we've covered everything. Um, it is, as has been said over and over again, a very fine judgment. Uh, but um, all the factors, I think, have been considered. We've gone through them in some detail. We've heard from the residents. Uh, we've, had, um, we've had the officer advice. It's been incorporated into the report. An awful lot of work has gone into this. So I think we're now in a position to, uh, to make a decision um, and um, so that the planning application can be lodged as soon as possible and get the um, get the housing underway, which is what our priority. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. So Councillor Davison has proposed and I've seconded that we go with um, op option one. Um, is that agreed, Cabinet colleagues? Agreed. agreed. Thank you very much. Right, so that was 6.1. Um, and um, Councillor McCrory has two more reports, which I hope, which I don't think will take quite so long. 6.2. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, well, in fact, um, really these two documents um, go together. So agenda item 6.2 and 6.3, planning obligations and making places supplementary planning documents. So if, if I can deal with these um, together and uh, if I can refer to them as SPDs from now on. So Cabinet um, will recall that both of these SPDs were agreed uh, back in July by Cabinet uh, and uh, to go out for consultation. And this happened later in the year later than what we had originally attended, but um, this was uh, as a result of the need to revise our statement of community involvement, which of course was necessitated by the COVID restrictions. Uh, nevertheless, a good level of response was received uh, in, in both cases. And uh, the recent January policy board recommended um, that both documents come before us tonight for final approval. And um, so here we are. The consultation responses received were evaluated and where appropriate, appropriate were incorporated into the each of the relevant SPDs. And most of the changes were around giving greater clarity on what was expected of um, developers. And there were some updated uh, policy requirements and some best, exa uh, best practice examples were also given. And the, the detail of these uh, representations are appended to each report for information. And of course, uh, once both SPDs uh, are adopted, they will be material uh, consideration in the determination of planning applications. I believe uh, the planning obligations SBD gives clear guidance to developers as to what is expected in the way of contributions for the necessary infrastructure. And likewise, the Making Places SBD uh, illustrates our high expectations for sustainable developments. And both these SPDs, together with those previously approved in the last 18 months or so, will ensure all developments, new developments, comply with this Council's high expectations as articulated in our Chelmsford uh, plan. So, Chair, I, um, I commend both supplementary planning documents as described in report 6.2 and 6.3 for Cabinet's approval. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor McCrory. Um, Councillor Bentley. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, yeah, my my concern really is is um, is um, in paragraph 9.18, the um, the change there that's that's been made um, to the document. Um, seems to me that you're you're weakening what was there originally um, by adding the words seek to negotiate section 106 agreements. I know um, it's a sort of fine detail, but um, but in my in my view, I think you know the developers should be um, given encouragement to actually demonstrate um, the the way in which carbon neutrality can be obtained in the properties that they are they're putting on their sites and to do that in the show houses just seems a no-brainer to me and and to you know sort of think that you have to negotiate or seek to negotiate that with them um, when we are all the time being encouraged by the uh, by the government to to move things forward in in the in the sense of bringing the you know the target 
2050 target into reality and, and not actually sort of making a bit of a stand over this. It just seems weak to me. Uh, if I may respond, Chairman. Uh, I think <laughs> these things uh, we, in planning, we always talk about a fine balance, don't we? Um, with these things, um, they're always subject to negotiation. And um, I think our record um, over the years has shown that the negotiations with uh, developers uh, in the main um, have brought great benefits in terms of Section 106 contributions and community infrastructure um, levy payments, which has enabled us to uh, carry out um, massive infrastructure improvements. And it's all about um, you know, just how far you can actually push with these things. There are such things as building regulations and we don't want to get into um, the situation where um, developers can go to appeal if we're trying to impose to um, stricter um, agreements with them. Um, I think as an example, the North East Chelmsford Community uh, Project neighbourhood up there, um, what is being proposed there uh, will be an exemplar and it just shows you what can be achieved when you do negotiate with developers and you do actually seek a common ground with them and get their agreement. So it, it is a negotiation um, and we just have to uh, rely on um, our officers um, and of course what's legally uh, available to us to carry out these negotiations and achieve the best possible uh, outcome. Yeah, I can I can appreciate all of that, Mike. Um, I'm, <laughs> my my I guess my concern is that with rewording it as seek to negotiate, it kind of weakens what we are trying to say that we will negotiate. Yeah. these things if we if we possibly can um and you know the way things are going at some point government is going to have to step in and it seems better for us to be ahead of that mm. rather than behind it um in terms of um imposing things on developers if we can do it voluntarily by negotiation rather than let them sort of say, well, you're only saying seek to negotiate, so you're probably not that bothered about it. I think it's a sign of strength if we if we say that we are going to negotiate. Well, um, I think we're into semantics, if I may say so. I mean, as I, I go back to the, the record that Chelmsford's got in um, Section 106 payments over the years and community infrastructure levy payments over the years, if you look at the chart across Essex, amongst other local authorities, you will see that um, Chelmsford is way, way above uh, the second, which is Colchester, and then miles and miles in front of uh, other districts in their negotiations. And uh, you look at Bewley, um, as an example, you've got a new secondary school, a primary school, sports pitches, a community centre, site for a health centre, local shops, uh, radial distribution route, a road which uh, is under construction. It will be late, we know that, because of the bridge construction. But you've got all that. You've got 22 million going towards Bewley Park Station um, and the North East Bypass. I mean, I, t I really don't think that you can fault the officers with their negotiating skills to get the most and the best deal for Chelmsford residents. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, Councillor Bentley, I think, um, you know, we share your frustration um, and um, I raised similar questions uh, that you've raised and um, was told that we can't push it any further because the local plan, which was a which was put through by the previous administration, um, has has settled things. Um, 
what we can do is hope that government changes policy. Sadly, this government changed policy in the wrong direction. Uh, up, um, the previous Labour government had a policy, all zero, all house, new houses, zero carbon by 2016. And uh, the Liberal Democrats supported that policy. Um, and then when the Conservatives got a majority, they took the policy away. Um, one thing that we have done um, in this SPD um, on developer obligations is say that we expect the council will take responsibility for public realm in future, whereas the previous administration was happy that a management company should manage public realm, um, which uh, we didn't think uh, was acceptable and has led to uh, some unsatisfactory arrangements in uh, some estates where the management companies have failed. So um, there are some good changes in these uh, policy documents um, and that they will be helpful in strengthening um, our zero carbon, low carbon ambitions. So, right. Um, Councillor Moore, if you want to come in briefly. Thank you, Chair. Yes, just to add to what you have said uh, regarding policy. Um, the government needs to lead by example. It's as simple as that to set carbon neutrality into legislation. Climate and ecological emergency bill, environment bill and planning legislation should all be linked. They do not work remotely. And, and we need to continue to press MPs um, for change on this because our hands are tied at a local level. We have to just simply encourage. And I know that we can review these papers um, after a certain period. Um, and as legislation looks likely to be brought forward, we can certainly um, look to review the detail. But I welcome your, co your comments, Councillor Bentley, and, um, and, I, and I agree. We, we continue to press for uh, carbon neutrality in our new homes. Thank you. OK, right. Um, we are about to move on, but Councillor Whitehead, come. Very, very briefly, Chairman. Now, can I just thank... Councillor McCrory for his endorsement of the previous administration's successes uh, and uh, are very happy uh, that uh, he knows what they are. Uh, we have no query with the current position on these SPDs uh, and uh, I I'm happy for you to continue in the way that we led you forward. Thank you. Well, yes, except as I said, you wanted to privatise public realm and we don't. That, that's a very minor change, and if that's the way you consider it to be, uh, again, we have no objections. There are problems with both, I think it's fair to say. Right, OK, let's move on now. Um, thank you for, for, for that. Um, are those two items agreed, members? Agreed. 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 Right, thank you very much. Um, so moving on to item seven, the fairer Chelmsford items, um, Councillor Davison, 7.1. Uh, thank you. I seem to be having trouble with my background effects, so let me just sort that out. Um, 7.1 is the local council tax support scheme. Um, Council tax support is the mechanism for reducing the council tax levied on people on lower incomes. It covers up to 100% of the council tax for pensioners and up to 77% uh, for those of working age. We need to introduce a new scheme each year, but we have essentially the same scheme in Chelmsford. We have had that since uh, April 2014. The rules are complex and are set out in the paper, but there are two key points. One of the regrettable consequences of COVID-19 is that more claims are being made than in the past. Uh, so the cost of this scheme next year is expected to increase. That means we will collect less council tax than we were banking on pre-COVID. To be fair, the government has provided £189,000 funding to recognise this. One option we could adopt would be to make the scheme less generous for working age uh, households as the paper sets out. But that would be uh, both wrong in principle, we would be trying to place the burden of paying for extra costs on the residents who can least afford it, uh, and it would also be doomed to failure in practice for the reasons set out. 
The second uh, point is that during 2020, the government responded to COVID-19 by making welfare payments more generous. Um, and that was intended to make recipients better off and was a good thing. But the benefit system is complicated and unintended consequences have a tendency to happen. Uh, this time, the entitlement to our LCTS scheme was reduced. We were in danger of clawing back the extra benefits the government was trying to give. Officers, uh, I'm very pleased to say, found a way to make sure that didn't happen in the current year. But for the future, we need to have the ability to tweak the, uh, the rules of this scheme so that we can ensure it doesn't happen. Um, and the paper sets out the revised wording to achieve this. So uh, having uh, drawn attention to those two points, um, I'm asking the Cabinet recommend to Council uh, the continuation of the current scheme into 21-22, uh, but amended to allow for in-year alterations as set out in the paper. Thank you. Any questions on LCTS? No, is that paper agreed? Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Okay, moving on 7 2 capital strategy. Um, okay, the financial strategies. Um, we are coming to the budget report shortly, um, but first, um, Council is obliged to uh, approve strategies for three things. First of all, for cash and borrowing, and that's the Treasury Management Strategy. Secondly, for capital investment in the capital programme, so that's the capital strategy. And thirdly, other investments, including property, and that's the investment strategy. Now, the capital strategy is uh, set out in the paper on pages six to ten. There's a lot of information. It's intended to be transparent and helpful, uh, but I don't think there's any need for me to go through it tonight, although I'm happy to answer any questions. The Treasury Management Strategy is on pages 11 to 19. Uh, that's been approved by the Treasury Management and Investment uh, Subcommittee. Uh, and there are two points there worth highlighting. Uh, first, the Council has an investment in what's known as the CCLA Property Fund. We've discussed this in the past because there is a minority view that we should divest ourselves of this investment. The strategy retains the, uh, the investment in this fund. Um, it is, of course, for the Director of Financial Services to decide whether to move funds uh, out of the um, or, or to move funds between different investments that are approved. Um, the second point is that uh, the Public Works Loans Board is our land lender of last resort. So if we need to borrow extensively, uh, uh, sorry, externally, we will seek the cheapest finance available from any lender in an open market. But if the market were to close, we would need to rely on the PWLB. The rules changed in the autumn and PBL, PWLB lending would be denied if we have any plans to buy any investment assets, primarily for yield. Um, and some of our existing property investments um, would be it, potentially in this category. So we can continue to hold those, but we must remove any such investments from our capital programme so that we can say that we have no uh, plans for any investments of this type. Uh, so those are the two uh, aspects of the Treasury management strategy worth uh, drawing your attention to. Uh, the third one strategy is the investment strategy on pages 20 to 25. Uh, again, there's lots of information. Again, it's intended to be transparent and helpful. Um, but again, there's no need for me to go through it unless there's uh, any questions. So uh, I propose that Council recommend these three strategies to uh, the Cabinet, uh, recommend them to Council. Thank you very much. Uh, I can't see any questions. So uh, is that ag agreed? Thank you. Agreed. Thank you very much. Agreed. All right, moving on to 7.3, the budget for next year. Right. Um, yes, we're discussing this budget report in very different circumstances compared with last year, but this is still a Liberal Democrat budget. The past year has been extremely hard on everyone, residents, businesses, voluntary groups and councils. We've seen it in the numbers of people contacting us for homelessness support, 
and in the £38 million pounds plus of grants. In fact, uh, I, I think um, we've, uh, as of today, we've paid out rather more than that. I think it's over £42 million pounds now of grants we've paid out to struggling local businesses. The 2021-22 uh, budget, though, presents a particular challenge. We must help Chelmsford to recover by making carefully chosen important investments whilst at the same time protecting our essential services that will deliver a greener, fairer, better connected Chelmsford. Uh, before I go into any detail, I want to thank the officers for all the work that's gone into this budget. It's been a particularly demanding exercise because of the scale of the challenge to achieve a balanced budget, the uncertainty that we still face, and the rate at which things have been changing over the last few months. Um, so, uh, and, and I'd like to be clear that Phil Reeves and his brilliant team pull the numbers together, but all officers across the City Council have responsibilities for our budget. And I'm sure that all members will want to join me in thanking all our officers for the thoroughly professional job they continue to do. Um, so the context, 2021 has been like no other year due to COVID-19. Income from car parks, theatres, leisure centres and so on will fall by £13 million pounds or more this year and expenditure will rise by half a million as we respond to the crisis. After government funding and other offsets, we expect a COVID-related deficit of around £3 million. Pounds. We've maintained and in some ways expanded services to residents. Unlike many other local authorities, we maintained all our bin collections, we kept our parks open, we also provided new COVID-related services, such as the hub that ensured vulnerable people had food and other essentials. And we've also taken on new tasks, such as coordinating the response to the pandemic, distributing uh, those grants, uh, almost 10,000 of them, um, in business support uh, payments. We've been innovative in the way that we've done things, for example, in holding council meetings uh, and new cabinet Q&A sessions, as we're doing this evening, virtually enabling far more residents to participate in local democracy and also in developing new ways of communicating using videos, for example. Um, these will be lasting improvements in the way we engage with residents. Um, so what about our progress towards achieving this year's priorities? Uh, this time last year, I said that our key priorities were the climate and ecological emergency and the housing crisis and that they infused the whole of the budget for 2020-21. We've continued to focus on these and they remain priorities for next year, 2021-22. In addressing the climate emergency, we provided for tree planting and woodland creation, supporting the objective of planting 175,000 additional trees over 10 years. So we plant one tree for every resident uh, and at least three new trees for every new home. Uh, and we have various measures to cut the use of private cars and encourage the shift to electric vehicles. Climate change is real and addressing it will help our economy to recover. We need to address our carbon emissions now to ensure the future for our children and our grandchildren. Therefore, despite the dreadful impact of COVID-19, we must keep necessary funding for a greener Chelmsford in the 2021-22 budget to deal with the greatest threat to our way of life. And in responding to the housing crisis, we published a homelessness and rough sleeping strategy and have made strong progress in our response to rough sleepers. We will continue to direct all those who are struggling to the appropriate support. We provided £7 million last year to buy houses for use as temporary accommodation. I can tell you that we expect to have agreed terms for at least 17 of these 20 by the 31st of March, with the exercise being completed early in next year, 2021-22. And we will deliver this significantly under budget. People everywhere are short of money and struggling to pay their bills. Housing is a basic right. It's never been more important to make housing accessible for all. We remain determined to greatly increase the provision of genuinely affordable homes in a fairer Chelmsford and are pushing on with new developments despite the lockdowns, including the 12 new homes we approved for social rent, the first time the council has facilitated new social rent uh, homes in what must be many years. 
Um, in arriving at the budget for 2021-22, we were faced with a unique challenge caused by COVID-19. We faced a potential budget gap of over seven and a half million pounds, much of it due to the virus. That's a challenge on a scale that the council has not seen before. The government has not stepped in to cover all our losses from the, from the pandemic. Just under one third of the gap is expected to be covered by government support. So that's welcome, but less than we were promised at the start of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and we must, of course, I can't stress this uh, highly enough, we must balance the books. So we're in a strong position for the future. Unlike the Chancellor of the Exchequer, we are legally required to set a balanced budget. So some hard decisions will have to be made. We've had to make a tough decision on charging for parking at Highlands, as I was saying earlier. Um, the value of parks and open spaces to residents has been amply demonstrated during the pandemic, and we know how loved uh, uh, Highlands is. We don't want to introduce parking charges, and we've always resisted doing so, despite most other country parks charging. But the overall financial situation means we must now do so if we're to continue to maintain and invest in the park to keep, the, to keep it the beautiful place that it is. We've also chosen to increase borrowing. There's no way out of this crisis without either stopping essential services or borrowing more. We cannot risk our reserves running out. National debt is the highest it's been since the 1960s and local government is under the same pressures. In 2021-22, we propose to borrow for asset replacements instead of funding them from the revenue budget. This will enable us to maintain services to residents, spreading the financial impact of COVID-19 over several years. And we will keep the council's level of borrowing affordable. This is a responsible approach that avoids making devastating cuts to services. And it also contrasts with Essex County Council, where the costs of borrowing to finance the capital programme are forecast to rise to what, in my view, is an unsustainable level of over 11% of spending. Our officers have done a fantastic job. We'd all like to thank them and to reward them for their dedication. Every year there's a negotiation between the council and its staff over the annual pay award. This doesn't reach a conclusion until after the budget has been set. So we always make financial provision in the budget before we know the outcome of the pay round with a delegation to the chief executive for any later adjustment to be taken through reserves. And this year is no different. Finally, we propose to increase council tax by the maximum amount permissible, £4.95 a year. This is not what we would want to do while many household budgets are under pressure. We have no real choice, as government financial support for local government has been reducing for over a decade. That's why the City Council has levied the maximum increase every year since at least 2015. The local council tax support scheme, which we've just um, we, we've just uh, uh, agreed to um, to propose to council will protect the poorest residents. And we've also stepped in this year to protect vulnerable young adults leaving social care by removing them from council tax altogether. The full amount the city council charges will still be under £204 a year for a band D property, under £4 a week, including the increase. The total council tax bill to taxpayers is much larger, of course, but we don't get to keep it. We pass on the vast majority of it to meet the demands made by Essex County Council and the Essex Police Fire and Crime Commissioner. Um, as I've uh, said, this has been a huge challenge even to maintain services in the face of the financial consequences of COVID-19. But there is good news in this budget. I am very pleased that, uh, firstly, I'm able to present a balanced budget. Not all, all local authorities have been as well managed. Um, and, and it's probably worth adding, uh, when I say a balanced budget, I mean that the budget balances. Uh, this budget, unlike Essex County Council, uh, does not assume £46 million of savings that uh, will be found later. Our budget balances. This maintains our essential services and the choices residents have, for example, to visit our outstanding parks. When the doors of our local shops can reopen, they will be keen to re-establish themselves at the heart of the local economy. Not increasing parking fees for next year will help to support our high street 
and our independent retailers to get back on their feet. The arts sector has been hard hit by the pandemic and was a fast growing sector before coronavirus arrived. We are taking this opportunity to make a targeted investment in the theatre and I explained that earlier. Um, attracting more visitors will help the arts to recover locally, providing a much needed boost for jobs for arts professionals. And we continue to develop important sites uh, at Waterside and Riverside that provide the medium term opportunity to shape the centre of our city for the future. So last year I presented an ambitious budget to refocus the City Council's financial resources to achieve the Liberal Democrat administration's objectives. Like many others, Chelmsford City Council was thrown off the financial course by COVID-19 in 2020-21, but strong financial management has allowed us to respond and to set a budget for 2021-22 to continue delivering a greener, fairer, better connected Chelmsford in the face of these severe financial headwinds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Sismi. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, I should like to join with uh, Councillor Davidson in uh, thanking officers for producing the budget in these very difficult times. Uh, we are continuing to look at the detail and uh, think there might be uh, some opportunities to reduce expenditure without adversely affecting uh, key services. Uh, having said that, on behalf of the Conservative Group, I should like to encourage the Cabinet to, con to reconsider the proposal in the 2021-2 uh, uh, budget uh, to charge for parking at Highlands Park. The car, uh, the car is the only way for most people to reach Highlands, and it is important that we encourage people to use this tremendous location uh, to, uh, to exercise and uh, uh, get fresh air. <clears throat> Parking charges at Highlands would have a particularly a, a negative effect on uh, Rittle, as people would inevitably uh, try to dodge the charge uh, by parking in the village, uh, causing significant disruption. Uh, I've listened to the points that Councillor Davidson made in response to the public questions, and uh, I'm not convinced that uh, uh, these, these are an adequate uh, response to uh, the points raised. Thank you. And uh, Thank you, Councillor Sismi. Um, I don't see any other hands. So I'm just pausing for a moment in case the independent group wanted to. No? No? OK. Um, well, thank you for your comments, um, Councillor Sismir. Um, I'm very proud of the, the budget that we are proposing in these extraordinarily difficult times. Um, having to find, uh, to fill a, a, a revenue cash gap of £7.5 million pounds and to be able to do that whilst increasing spending on some of our environmental objectives um, is no mean achievement. Um, investing in affordable housing is an invest to save measure um, and it's the responsible thing to do, looking after the most vulnerable in our society and dealing with the climate and ecology emergency um, remains the biggest threat to our way of life. Um, it will be a problem long after COVID stops being a problem. Um, and it's no good putting off the day for doing something about uh, about climate change. Um, we've had to look at making savings um, and we have redu uh, reduced, uh, we won't fill all some of the vacant posts. Uh, we will be using smarter use of technology, uh, reducing use of paper, uh, other administrative savings behind the scenes. Um, we will reduce cash spending uh, by uh, we have to borrow to uh, buy new equipment, uh, but that we think is a reasonable uh, compromise. Um, we will also seek to charge developers more uh, for planning, for building services and planning advice. Um, and on on Highlands, we do, we are faced with some difficult choices, but we don't think it's fair that thousands of people from outside Chelmsford don't pay a penny towards Highlands Park. And we, we think that they should make a, a contribution. And uh, we will be consulting on further detail and we look forward to uh, discussing it with Rittle Parish Council. 
it's a, it, but it is tough. Uh, we, we, we face tough times and unlike the county council, we've been explicit about balancing the budget. So I'm very proud that we will be able to continue our work for a greener, fairer Chelmsford. Um, and you were just jumped in there, Councillor Galley. Um, <laughs> I'll let you come in. That's extremely kind of you, Chair. I, I, I thought so, but I'd uh, like to be helpful. Yeah, it's always nice when people change. Uh, <laughs> can I, first of all, agree with Councillor Davidson that the work that goes on behind this budget setting is something that I've had 16 years practice at. And I, I'm very aware that the work that goes on behind the scenes. I also am very aware and I do appreciate that this year is a budget like no ever, no, no ever before. And one hopes will never be again. One hopes that things will become slightly easier over the coming year, particularly in the budget timing that we're trying to set. Um, I think the car parking is something we will probably come back to in full council. There are lots of other balancing arguments that needs to be discussed regarding that particular item. Uh, but the one item that concerns me a little bit, and I thought I'd just bring it to give you the opportunity to rethink this part, and that's to do with bereavement charges. At a particular time, unprecedented times, phenomenal amount of deaths are taking place in our, in our city council area. Uh, and to suddenly decide to increase the bereavement charges by no less than 12% when nobody has any option to, to bury their dead, I think is, is rather a little bit immoral. And it's such an easy take because nobody can do anything about it. And I think obviously in such harrowing times with deaths, and you know, they talk about the numbers, but it's actually every number represents a family in some shape or form, that all have to go through the motions of uh, burying their dead. And to increase the charge for that by some 12%, if that charge goes to the funeral director, we all know it all gets handed down to the customer at the end of the day. And I just feel that there would be better ways to recoup what I think is 100, 193,000, I think the figures quoted in the figures, I stand corrected. I just think it's something that morally, I think you as a cabinet need to relook at in these uncertain times. Yes, we might be making a loss on it, but there are times and timing is everything. And I think this is not the right time to introduce a new payment like that in such trepid times. Apart from that, we're still discussing most of the things at the moment. And I do applaud Councillor Davis and the, the work that he's obviously put into uh, getting these figures together. In, in, the, in the circumstances, I think he's following on from the history of this council having a very strong financial base. Um, in general terms, I tend to agree with what he's doing. There's, there's a few things that I, I'm still looking into. But in the main, I, I applaud him for getting to the position that he's in now. Uh, and just ask him to look at that one situation from my point of view. And that's all I have to say at this moment. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the opportunity. Councillor Davison. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Galley for what he said. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to have a further conversation between now and Council in February. Um, with Councillor Galley or Councillor Sismi, uh, as the case may be. Uh, if you have alternative suggestions, um, we're very happy to discuss them. Uh, what I said in, in introducing the budget was that we have had to make some difficult decisions. I didn't list that one. Uh, clearly, uh, it's not something that we would uh, particularly want to do, but we have had to find ways to balance the budget, and that's one of them. Um, and uh, there are a number of things uh, in here um, that are difficult choices, frankly. Um, so, yes, I'm very happy to uh, to have a further conversation offline about those uh, those difficult choices. 
Thank you, indeed. Um, it, it's a very it's a very difficult balancing act, but when um, seven and a half million pounds has evaporated, and there are very very few uh, sources of income that we control, um, council tax is not can't go up by much, and is a very small proportion of our total income. Um, so yeah, we look we look forward to sort of constructive comments, uh, suggestions from the opposition. Um, I don't see any other hands. Um, so thank you everyone for your contributions uh, this evening. Um, I, I think um, all of the members of the public have dropped away now, but I thank them for